Hello, everyone. My name is Rob Kozak. I'm a proud UBC alumnus and the Dean of the Faculty of Forestry. And I'm delighted to be your host for our virtual program this, this afternoon entitled Old Growth Forests, What is the Path Forward? I would like to begin by acknowledging that UBC's Vancouver uh, Point Grey campus is situated on the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Musqueam people and that UBC Okanagan is situated on the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Sayalx Okanagan Nation. Uh, for millennia, these sites uh, have been places of learning uh, where cultures, histories, traditions, and, and knowledge are passed on from one generation to the next. And it's very much in that spirit that, that we are gathered here today. I'd also like to recognize that, that many of you may be joining us from many different places near and, and far, and, and would encourage you to acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of, of those lands. Uh, by doing so, we are reminded that Canada's legacy of, of colonization continues into the present and that all of us have an obligation uh, to advance decolonization in this country and, and to take meaningful progress on, on the 94 calls to action set forth, forth by the the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. So today we are here to have a, a conversation, um, an important conversation that, that we've been having for decades now uh, on old growth forests. Now, I, I don't have to explain that this has and, and continues to be a highly contentious topic. Our hope today is that we can contribute to this debate by convening a, a table uh, where we talk respectfully on this critically important issue and 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 take the time to listen to one another. Um, to that end, we've gathered um, an amazing expert panel of, of um, speakers who have done a good deal of thinking on, on this subject of old growth forests. Each speaker uh, comes with their own lens on this issue, um, and each is incredibly knowledgeable. Um, and, and while I diversity of perspectives will be presented, our hope is, is that the dialogue will center, center or at least land on some commonalities and, and a potential path forward. Um, to ask questions of our speakers, uh, we will be using Slido, uh, our, our online audience engagement platform. Um, you'll have received instructions on, on how to use Slido in, in the reminder email um, for this webinar. Webinar, And, and some of you uh, may have already inputted your questions. Uh, but just as a quick reminder, to enter your own question or vote on your favorites or upvote, please go to slido.com and use the event Old Growth uh, to sign in. You'll, you'll see the instructions on the screen and the link that's also being um, shared, I think, in the chat. Okay, so without further ado, let's let's um, get going on our webinar. And um, I'm really honored to have the opportunity to introduce you to our moderator today, uh, my friend and, and colleague, Professor Sally Aitken. Um, Sally is a UBC alumna, a professor, and the Associate Dean of Research and Innovation with the Faculty of Forestry. She's an internationally renowned scholar with a, a very long resume indeed, um, notably in, in an era of, of rapid climate change. Um, Sally has been instrumental in, in reimagining the way we stock, restock our forests with her innovative work in genomics and, and climate mapping technologies. Um, she is also um, the coordinator of the BC Big Tree Registry, which documents the biggest trees in, in British Columbia. Um, so thank you very much for joining us today and for moderating this event. Sally, the, the screen is now yours. Thanks very much, Rob, and uh, welcome to everyone in the audience today, and especially uh, to our panelists. We're so happy that they are here. Um, so I'm really happy to be able to participate in and help this uh, important discussion. So uh, today our panel is structured uh, so that each panelist will have time for a short presentation, and then I'll be leading a discussion uh, followed by questions from the audience. And as Rob mentioned, those questions will be coming from slido.com. You just enter the event code old growth and you'll be able to pose questions there. You'll also be able to upvote questions there. 
So it's an excellent participation for you to actively participate in this discussion. It's now my great pleasure to introduce the first speaker for today, Chief Counselor Robert Dennis. Chief Dennis is the elected Chief Counselor for the Huayat First Nation on Vancouver Island. He's been serving his community for over 30 years, 24 of those in his current position. And uh, in one of the most important projects of the Huayat Nation, he, along with the nation's economic development strategy team, purchased 11 properties in Bamfield and also negotiated partial ownership in a, a large tree farm license uh, on Huayat territory on Vancouver Island. So I'm very pleased Chief Dennis is here with us today and uh, I really look forward to hearing more about, uh, about his uh, perspectives on old growth and on forestry within, uh, within his territory. So with that, I'll turn the uh, screen over to Chief Dennis. Good, thank you. And uh, here's uh, my my first, uh, first, first of all, thank you for having me here today. I'm greatly honored to be here. Uh, greatly honored to, to provide uh, what, what our vision is about the, our path moving forward. And I wanted to start with this particular video and uh, or this particular slide where you see, this is uh, what we call the House of Hohea. As you can see, it's, it's built with huge structures. Uh, there's cedar posts. Those are, all of them are over six feet in diameter. If you look on the roof, there's the spruce beams there that are, that hold up the roof. Uh, and, uh, and, and uh, they're also six feet wide and then about, probably about 110 feet long. And uh, so moving forward, we want to continue to be able to, to build these type of structures in our territory as our population grows. Uh, our biggest threat is that uh, people are calling for the to halt all old growth logging in BC. So to me, when they say that, is that okay, Hoyt, uh, we're not going to allow you to build any more structures like this anymore. So that's what that means to me. Next. <clears throat> I really wanted to show this particular uh, uh, sign that we have at the beginning of our territory. And uh, we put this up in about 2010, but it said, Hawaiian First Nation, Hishuk Sawak, welcome to our territory. Owners for, for 10,000 years, stewards again after 150 years. Please treat our children's inheritance with respect. This is our, our land, what we call Nisma. Our land, our people, our resources, that this is where we live. So the land is our culture. Next. This here just goes to show you how we manage uh, moving forward. We look at it as our territory where we have exclusive land, in other words, that is lands owned by Huayat and or where we have shared jurisdiction with the province or, or, or Parks Canada, for example. So this is our way of how do we, how do we manage our lands moving forward. So mainly for us, our territory is exclusive lands or are, are ours are solely to, to manage. And the shared lands are, are managed with, in some cases, like for 10 years with, uh, with the province and following their guidelines. Next. Our land, I just wanted to be really quick here. We're a very small territory, 78,500 hectares. We had former reserve lands of 1,077 hectares, which was about 1.4% of our total territory. Uh, we, we've been busy buying up private lands. We now own private lands that amount to 780 hectares. We have a First Nation woodland license and we have a community forest license. And as indicated, we're now partners in the Sawakan forestry in which it is 153,000 hectares and that's TFL 44. Next. Our people, the Hoyet, in pre-contact, we numbered over 2,000 people. Uh, Pre-contact, we lived in 53 village sites around the territory. So you would have seen the House of Hawaii structures in 53 village sites around our territory. George Blankensop, a federal agent working for Canada in 1874, identified 27 village sites for the Hoyat. Next. 
our people the Hue. And I really wanted to show this this photo uh, to, to show people of how we engage with our people on, on really key key issues. And notice this is in the House of Hoyt. Notice the amount of people we have attending this particular meeting. So, you know, that, that myth of that decisions are only made by, by councils, uh, this destroys that myth. The Indian Reserve Commissioner allocated 13 reserves. In other words, you can see they only half what the, the previous commissioner identified. Our population was reduced by war, diseases, natural disasters, and colonization. Today we number, actually I know what the number is now, 863. By 2051, we project to have a population of 2200. Next. The nation depends on forests for many needs and resource harvesting is key. Our recreational activity is key. Uh, our cultural activity is, is paramount in what we do. It's really important that we be able to continue our, our cultural activity. And as we know, uh, colonial practices have uh, stopped our, our cultural activity or put it at a standstill for a while. And then we're pleased to say that uh, the government in Canada failed in their attempt to, you know, to, to, to wipe out our culture. Uh, forestry is also important uh, from an economic perspective as it creates employment and revenue for our nation. Uh, when I became chief counselor in 1995, we had two Hawaii people working in forestry. Today we have 44. Next. Taking control of our forest, that to me is one of the main things of moving forward for Hawaii at First Nation. In the past, we we seen different logging companies, uh, you know, log the, the Forest Valley, in particular the Sarita Valley, and we didn't like what we saw. So we we wanted to move to a point where we're controlling what, what happens and how the forest is, is, uh, is uh, managed. In the past, we've seen the province mismanage our, our lands for far too long. And I'm pleased to say now with this current government, I, I'm, I'm happy in terms of how we're working together to try to find a balance uh, to, to make forestry and, and uh, environmental and cultural things and economic things work for us. It's our turn to be in the driver's seat. Uh, you know, I, I have this phrase, you wrecked it, we're gonna fix it. So we want to be in a position moving forward that we're making the decisions in our territory. Next. Our resources. Uh, we once had 35 salmon streams that produced millions of salmon. Today we're probably down to maybe three or four that only produce hundreds and maybe lucky we get to thousands of salmon. So this becomes a really key issue for us. And in 1993, the Hawaii elders mandated us to fix our stream and to manage the forest based on our needs and our interests. And of course, our resources, uh, there's wildlife that provides food and clothing, marine resources that, that provide uh, us our, our seafood that, that we, we have to have. It's a main part of our, our, our staple food, migratory birds. And at one time, we uh, 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 estimated that our forests were 75 million to 80 million cubic meters of standing timber. Next. This here is a photo of the Kli Klia. Uh, it's the name of the canoe, our canoe, this one. It's a 40 foot canoe. Uh, the canoe is made from huge old growth cedars found part way up mountains. And this uh, particular uh, tree that was used to make this canoe was estimated to be over 500 years old. As I said, the canoe is about 40 feet long and it's probably five and a half, six feet in, in uh, wide. Next. And uh, I really want to say a little bit more about our, our traditional canoe. Every, every year, uh, First Nations around the province, uh, from Washington State, we gather in annual canoe journeys. In the last two years, we haven't had any, but thousands of our people attend these canoe journeys. And uh, it brings back our culture, it brings back our spirituality. And uh, we encourage young people to, to participate because we want to get them, off the, get them off the street, get them off the drugs, get them off the, the liquor. And uh, this, this becomes a really, really important part of, of our, our culture now because we're, we're teaching our young people our culture and our spirituality. 
uh, at, at these uh, annual canoe journeys. And this canoe, if, if sold, would probably, uh, this is a low estimate from oh, three years ago, $100,000. I'm sure now it's more than that. Next. This year, I wanted to show this because it, sure it's a carving, uh, maybe to the average person it's just a carving, but to me it's a, a carving of a sea otter. A sea otter was an important part of our, our, our uh, ecosystem. And as you can see, the sea otter has a sea urchin in its paws there. And like us, they eat sea otter, or uh, uh, sea urchin, sorry. And uh, as, as uh, Hawaiian people, we love sea urchin. This is a uh, a uh, main uh, delicacy for us, and we love eating it. Next. Hawaiian forestry principles, uh, guiding principles, it should say. Uh, we adopted this in 1997, and I want to tell the audience here that uh, I think a lot of people think Indians don't know how to manage, uh, Indians don't know what they're doing. Well, this year was adopted and approved by Hawaii in 1997. The, the principles are one, managing forests and fishery values to meet present needs without compromising the needs of future Hawaiian generations. Two, managing forests based on Hawaiian values, ASOC, which is utmost respect, who also taking care of, and Hishik Matsawak, everything is one. Three, balancing forest values to meet economic and cultural needs of peoples within the Ha'uthi of the Hawaiian, Ha'uthi is territory, including the Hawaiian First Nation citizens. Next. Number four, restore, restoring the damaged ecologies in the most critical 15 watersheds within the Ha'uthi of the Hawaiian Hawaii. And those, those streams are really important for us to renew and, and restore. Five, conserving biological diversity, soil, water, fish, wildlife, scenic diversity, and other forest resources within the Ha'uthi of the Hawaiian Hawaii. Six, this one is really recently added by our hereditary chiefs within the past two years. And it is giving serious consideration about the needs to be left behind old growth, as well as what can be sustainably harvested and putting back what you take out. And so this, this moving forward, number six, is probably one of the most uh, important principles for us. Next. Following sacred principles, uh, Hawaii First Nations has been steward of their territory since time immemorial. And this is, this is what we want to do, pass forward again. It's our land, uh, our resources, enable us to take care of these lands. We manage our lands following our, our values and sacred principles. Next. This one, I just want to speak a little bit more. ESOC, you know, when visitors come to our lands, we want to say they're welcome, but uh, they, they should, when they come to our lands, we respect what we want from our lands. And uh, I, I really want to emphasize that, uh, that we want people to respect what, what we want, and that's uh, important, respecting that. Uh, in terms of uh, provincial standards and forestry uh, policy, we respect that and we apply that to the management of our crown tenures. Our hot, hot wave values are applied and uh, respect and honor the vision of our leadership. And that, that to me is really important because our leadership is elected by our people. And uh, so when we speak and we say, you know, we want you to come to our lands in a respectful way, please abide by that. Next. Who also, this is a really important value it means to take care of and and our elders in the past have always said we got to take care of our salmon we got to take care of our deer we got to take care of our elk we got to make sure that there there's these are there for our future generations and we had a really simple uh, 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 saying is you know what you take out you must put back in Decision making with future generations in mind is, is very key to us in, in terms of the path forward. Our little nation on the West Coast has planted one and a half million trees since 2011. And, and we're proud of that because now we know of that 1,500,000 uh, trees, some of those are going to become old growth forests in the future. Next. Hishik Matsawak, everything is one. Every decision we make will affect the resource of our territory. 
I, I tell people you can't uh, manage uh, uh, another resource in the isolation of another. Uh, from the migratory birds to our forests and citizens, they are all connected. Next. Our goal, managing Hoyt forests properly to meet present needs without compromising the needs of future generations. That is our main principle moving forward. We are thinking of generations to come. Second growth will support future generations. Next. We just wanted to show here what we do when we when we harvest our lands. Uh, we, we recently harvested a, 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 a patch of land here, but it was first harvested in 1940, and the second harvest was in the spring of 2016, and we reforested that in the spring of 2017. So when when people come out to to, to uh, the Old Growth Summit, they will showcase some of these areas that we're replanting and, and what we're doing. And the estimated next harvest is 2017. I'm a strong proponent of that being even, even longer. So Hawaii, 10 years, we have private land, we have treaty land, we have First Nation woodland license, we have community forest license, and of course, most recently, we're now uh, full partners in TFL 44, now called uh, South Walk-In Forest. Next. Remember to protect our marine resources. This is an important message that we received from our elders in 1993. So we're, we're glad to say that we're carrying this forward. We want to show people in the audience here that, you know, managing our forests just didn't happen yesterday. It didn't happen a couple of years ago. We got a mandate in 1993 from our elders to, to take care of the land. Look at renewing the salmon streams, replenishing the salmon stocks, enhancing them where we need to, and ensuring our salmon and other marine resources will be available for future generations. Next. Timber harvesting. Uh, we also want to tell people that, you know, that this is, we have to, we have to pull a balance here. Uh, we have to manage forests for economic purposes, for cultural purposes, for environmental purposes. So from the economic side, we plan and develop uh, uh, harvesting plans. Uh, some are five years, some are 10, some are 20. Uh, we average, uh, we log about 150,000 cubic meters a year. 65% uh, of that is local and about 35% is exported because under the treaty, uh, one of the things uh, we, we gained was our ability to export. And it was a, a trade-off because a lot of things we lost in the treaty. This was the trade-off having our ability to export logs. Uh, we want to have a, a 36 employment, sustainable employment target. In other words, people that are working year round, uh, not just having you know, part-time jobs, but, but full-time jobs. We want to get 36, that's our target. And we have timber sale agreements with different uh, harvesting companies in the area. Next. Harvesting for many purposes. This is what people need to know that, that we, we harvest timber for different purposes. As I mentioned, you know, we're, we're going to be building structures like the House of Boyet in the future. Uh, we call the cedars humis in our language. And uh, we always look at the industry, it has its up and down. You know, it has its bright days where things are going fantastically well. And then it has its dark days where, where things uh, do become dark. And for us, it, it did become dark when we were re removed from the forest industry our people ended up on the welfare lines, our people ended up migrating to, to urban communities where life wasn't much better for them there. So we're, you know, we're, we're gradually looking at that, you know, what, what is our plan? So we want to get our people back home, moving forward. We want to have them home. We want them to have sustainable jobs. And uh, for those that want to work in the forest industry, well, here's the opportunity. Those that want to work in the tourism, here's the opportunity. Next. So walking, now, this is a really important uh, uh, phrase for OAD. And it, it is working as one for a working forest. So that is why we chose that name. So walking means we are one. And then that, that, that's important because we see government as, as uh, we have to work with government. We got to work with the industry. We have to work with other First Nations. We have to work with the union. We got to work with contractors. And missing from that list very deliberately here 
is that I want to be working with environmental groups and saying, okay, what, what can we do to be managing forests and old growth forests moving forward? Uh, I, I left out deliberately because I, I, I myself have not received an invitation from any environmental group to work with us regarding uh, forest management. Next. Finding a balance, this is really important. Uh, we're not a one issue nation. Uh, we, we have multiple interests that we have to look at and consider. Hishuk uh, Matsawak, everything is connected. We gotta, we gotta look at stewardship. We gotta look at fishery renewal. We have to look at wildlife. We have to look at Hawaii culture and Aboriginal rights. We have to look at the environment, the old growth and the economy. So, so that's what, what it is for us moving forward. Again, I'll repeat it, we're not a one-issue nation. We have multiple, multiple issues that we have to consider. Next. Hishuk Matsawak Integrated Resource Management Plan, a maiden Hawaiian management process for, for the Hawaii to decide on how their resources will be managed. That is what we want in terms of our path forward. It, it's, I'll say it again, you know, you wrecked it, we're gonna fix it. And that's gonna be our goal and our objective. And we're going to find it in a very, very balanced way. And uh, the integrated resource management resource management plan is a, a Hoyt-led uh, process. Uh, we we plan to look at uh, the existing plans. We'll look at community values. We'll look look at the community well-being. We'll look at environmental and ecosystem values. We'll look at cultural values. We'll, we'll look at traditional knowledge and the, the legislative context and the economic opportunities. So we got to consider all those. And once they're all considered, put into a package, we're going to develop an integrated resource management plan. And that is going to be our path forward. That is our commitment. And that, that is what our people have directed us to do. And, uh, and that's what our Hawaiian uh, Council has, uh, or our Hawaiian uh, Huffley Council has directed us to do. Next. Uh, the H, uh, Hawaii Integrated Resource Ma Management Plan involves helping citizens gain an understanding of their values and for the Aote support from my diverse technical team. And that's what, what I'm really proud of here is that uh, we done our first timber supply analysis, analysis probably 1997, followed up with another one in, in 2005 or five. And now we fall 2015, we've been using LIDAR. And so we, we have a technical team that enables us to look at our forests and help us support uh, you know, the planning strategies that we need moving forward. And understanding current conditions and practices across the entire policy and developing a clear objectives, measurable targets and thresholds for the identified values. For example, we, we see that with a, a proper management plan, will actually be able to increase the amount of old growth in our territory moving forward. Using models to run scenarios that, that uh, test options, selection, uh, the desired option, and implementation and monitoring. Next. So with that, uh, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to speak to you. Chako, Chako, thank you very much, George. Thank you very much, uh, Chief Dennis. That was just a, a lovely overview of the resources and the and the culture uh, of the Hawaiian and how you're approaching uh, land management and forest management. Uh, and uh, we wrecked it, and you're going to fix it. I love that. So uh, with that, we'll move on to our next speaker, and uh, we'll bring. Uh, Chief Dennis back into the conversation when we get to the discussion uh, format. So our next speaker is Cam Brown. And so Cam holds, uh, he's another forestry alum. He holds a forestry degree from UBC as well as from Oregon State University. And he's a registered professional forester in both BC and in Saskatchewan, where they have a lot of really big trees, right Cam? Uh, he has over 25 years of experience working in the forest sector. Um, mainly in consulting roles in Western Canada. He manages foresight consultants, uh, resource management and technology business unit, uh, which offers analytical planning um, 
and uh, analyses and planning um, for the Canadian forest industry. And so, Cam, thank you uh, for being here today and for bringing your perspectives as a professional forester uh, to our panel. I think you're muted, Cam. We're just having a brief technical problem with the sound. Just a reminder, while we get this sorted, that you can go to slido.com, enter old growth, and see the questions people are posting. How would that sound? There, that's better. Okay, sorry for that, that was weird. It somehow changed. Thanks very much for the opportunity to speak. I'll start again. Um, I want to recognize uh, some great work that was done by Al Gorley and Gary Merkel to kind of set the stage for a lot of this conversation back in 2020. They, they talked to a lot of people and came up with uh, 14 recommendations on how to improve how we manage forests uh, and it will grow specifically in, in, in the province. Uh, those recommendations included things like indigenous involvement, prioritize the ecosystem health, uh, zonation, uh, better information. And a, and a key one was this deferral of high value uh, near high, very high and near-term risk of irreversible, irreversible biodiversity loss stands. Um, and that's going to buy us some time while we, while we revamp and create a, a better long-term strategy. At about the same time, uh, we had a, a report come out uh, called The Last Stand for Biodiversity. Uh, and in that report, it cited that there was only 3% of BC's old growth that was big and 80% and of it was small. Uh, and this created a bit of a sense of scarcity in, in the public. Um, but I'm going to argue that uh, that number isn't particularly accurate of what's going on. Uh, it would have kind of an inappropriate use of provincial forest inventory data. As an example, none of Ferry Creek was included in that 3%. Um, and in general, the interior forests were held to the same big standard as coastal forests. So you ended up with a fairly small uh, numerator and a great big denominator of the whole province. Um, if I was to try to characterize with, with accurate data we're using heights, uh, I would suggest that 36% of the old growth today is big. But admittedly, that's a subjective definition of what is big. Uh, truly, truly big stands are, are quite rare. Um, but it, again, these provincial numbers, numbers level numbers don't really help us assess risk to biodiversity. We really need to drill down. Um, but before I do that, I just want to give you a quick example of, of why that 3% number isn't right, and it's just not nearly as, as dire as what that number might suggest. This is a stand in Haida Gwaii um, in our forest inventory. You can see the image underneath. It's a, it's a quality old growth stand. It's 353 years old, 40 meters tall, has a site index of 15, so a relatively low site index. Yet there's a UBC Big Tree Registry verified Sitka spruce here that's three and a half meters at the base and 66 meters tall. Truly a, 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 a good quality, large old growth stand, but it didn't get counted in the 3% simply because they were using site index to measure big trees, as opposed to using the height, which is which is right there and ready and able to be used. So site index is just simply not a good way to assess the amount of big old growth in the province. So let's, let's step up and get some big perspective here. Um, I think everyone agrees, uh, government, uh, everyone publishing on the subject recently, there's about uh, 11 million hectares of old growth in the province. It represents about 21% of our provincial old growth. Um, and if you look at that from historical terms of what would have been there naturally, it's about half or so. Maybe, maybe there would have been 12, 13, 14, or sorry, 22 to 23 million hectares of old growth forest across the province uh, historically. We're at about half that value now uh, for a range of reasons, which, which would include logging and natural disturbance. If you look at how that old growth is distributed, there's clearly more old forest on the coast uh, than there is in the interior. Uh, you can definitely pick out areas where we've seen significant mountain pine beetle impact and large fires uh, in, in the last decades. 
but the, the key here is that there's, it varies across the province and the natural amount of oil will also vary across the province. Um, I also want to reinforce the point that about 75% of this 11 million hectares of oil growth is either currently protected or like full legal protected. 39% uh, of it is legally protected and another 36% of it is in what I would call a non-timber harvesting land base, which means it's, you could log there, but it's just very unlikely that you would log there. That's why we call it the non-timber harvesting land base. But again, we need to get to some smaller scales to really understand risk to biodiversity. Because that's really, from my perspective, the, this idea of talking about old forests is really about managing for biodiversity. So we can look at specific ecosystems. Uh, and one way to assess risk uh, uh, in an ecosystem is to understand how much have we changed it relative to what it would have been naturally or historically? Um, so a given ecosystem maybe had 50% old, uh, old forest in it uh, over time under natural processes, and maybe now we're down to 25% old growth. Uh, so that's, you know, we're at 50% of the natural amount that would occur there. These graphs reflect th that type of value for a, a whole range of ecosystems. So these are all the coastal ecosystems. Um, if we're up in the green zone, uh, you know, we're at pretty low risk to biodiversity. If we're down in the yellow zone, we're at fairly high risk to biodiversity. So we're in very little of the original old growth left. Um, what you can see is across the coast, uh, you know, we're kind of middle of the road mostly in most cases. You know, these dots represent the amount of area. So this, this is a really big amount of area. Um, and we're down in the 45, 50% range. Um, areas that are really you know, very high risk for biodiversity are the ones down in these lower areas. So the, the, the really dry uh, CDF zones and the really dry uh, coastal western hemlock zones. Those are clearly at, at potentially very high risk and warrant further, further investigation. This graph here represents uh, the interior cedar hemlock zone. And you can see a, a real mix here. So some stands, some areas have as much old growth as they would have historically. Uh, and some have a fraction thereof. Um, and again, it's these ones in the yellow that we might want to be concerned and thinking about at, as at very high risk. Um, but there's more to the story because the, the deferral process that was completed by the TAP now put deferrals in every single ecosystem, not just the ones that were down in this yellow zone. Every single ecosystem got deferrals. And that's because they, there was a perception of risk around the big tree presence within each and every ecosystem, not just uh, the ecosystem as a whole. So all of these, all of this old growth, well, there's lots of old growth that may not be the right size old growth. So we need to think about representation by productivity class. Big trees matter, uh, but so do small ones. Uh, it's key to recognize though that we have, we have disproportionately harvested large old stands relative to small old stands, just by the facts of the economics of the industry uh, and where the valley bottoms are and where we started logging, we have disproportionately impacted those large valley bottom stands. So it's critical that we put in something in place to make sure that these large old forests uh, are still represented on the land base. This graph kind of tells that story a little bit. If you look across the entire coast, and again, this is somewhat generalized, but you can see in, in lower site index classes here, zero to five, all the way up to 20 to 25, you know, there's about 50% old growth in each of those uh, site productivity classes. Whereas at the very highest class, um, we're down to 27% old growth in that case. So clearly there's, a, there's, a, there's an issue that we need to be thinking about to preserve old growth in, in, in those higher productivity sites uh, to make sure we have the, the, some of this very large old growth. But it is important to remember that we're trying to manage for biodiversity uh, and that, that means providing representation across all scales. Um, this graph here uh, was in the TAPPAL report and you know, does a good job of, of displaying, you know, very large trees are quite rare uh, which is why we want to be careful and make sure we protect them. Uh, but a lot of the old growth that we're going to see in the province is not going to be big. It's going to be sitting down in these, these small and medium categories. Um, it, and when we create long-term representation strategies, it will be critical for us to make sure that we have this representation across uh, age and size categories um, within our old growth strategies. A quick tour down BC Forest Policy Lane. Um, you know, for the, early in the century, uh, we were pretty much focused on sustained yield forestry. So our, our goal was harvesting growth. If, if we don't, we're always harvesting what the forest grew every year, we knew it was sustainable, but that was from a very much a timber production perspective. We weren't thinking of, about ecosystem value, ecosystem health or other values. In the 1990s, we had the Forest Practices Code, code come in and eventually FERPA, which brought in, uh, 
consideration, more consideration of non-timber values. So we're, we're managing for wildlife and water, um, uh, ecosystem and biodiversity. Um, and I've shown them as balanced here. You could debate that for a, a long period of time. I don't want to get into the debate, but the point I'm trying to make here is that we've compromised timber production to meet uh, ecosystem and non-timber value uh, objectives. And we've also done the same, where ecosystem health values have been compromised in the name of timber production. So there's been a balance struck there, whether it's the right or the wrong one is, is up is the question. And where we're going from here is a, a, a continuation or an evolution of sustainable forest management that's bringing in First Nations values and likely to be put more heavily weighting, more heavily put more weight on ecosystem health, uh, potentially at the expense of timber production. Um, it, how we strike these balances need to be driven locally and obviously need to involve First Nations in the planning process as, as Dennis just spoke to so eloquently. This is a graph actually actually from Walk in Forestry, uh, what uh, Chief Dennis is from, was speaking to. This idea of creating an integrated land use, integrated resource management plan at a local scale with relevant experts, uh, bringing in to play all of the various values uh, and then using that to drive out what we do on the ground. Um, this is really critical stuff um, and, and it's really difficult to get this right. When you're trying to deal with a, a provincial scale, you need to drill down and get local people involved, particularly First Nations. Um, and as we do that, I just want to put a quick reminder out there. Uh, I think most people know this, but I'm just to reinforce it. Um, you know, our forests vary significantly across BC and how we choose to manage for old growth in a, in a BC coastal environment with cedar hemlock stands that live for, for hundreds to thousands of years to something like the dry belt Douglas fir in the, in the Okanagan or the Rocky Mountain Trench. Very different approaches to old growth and stand structure. Uh, and again, different in high elevation spruce balsam or boreal spruce pine up uh, around Fort St. John or, or north of Prince George. Um, it's not a one size fits all strategy and each one of these, these natural, natural disturbance types will help us drive out what is important to produce old growth on a continual basis uh, and how we manage forests in and around those, those old growth stands um, to provide for long-term value. Uh, just a really quick, uh, difference here. If you look at the, the, the red and the dark orange, these are long-lived stands both in the interior wet belt and on the coast. How we manage forests there will be very different than the tan area here in the middle, which is an area where we have frequent large-scale stand replacing fire. Um, if we try to manage old growth in the same way by putting fences around it and protecting it, it's just going to burn up. We need to have much more robust uh, strategies for making sure we've got recruitment uh, and replacement of old stands likely something like longer rotation ages to support uh, old growth development within uh, these highly dynamic ecosystems. So my take home messages, I guess for today, are we can and should, how improve, can and should improve how we manage old forests in BC, but it's not quite as dire as, as some people have made it out to be. We wanna build on the solid foundation of sustainable forest management planning we have in place, but increase the emphasis on ecosystem health and old forest representation. That's the paradigm shift that we need to go through is putting more of a lens on ecosystem health as we think about how much old growth, how, where to leave it, and, and how to build structures in the areas we're logging that support biodiversity outside of the areas where we've set aside old growth. Um, and the way to achieve that is really about bringing First Nations in as, as key decision makers and helping to lead the planning processes. Uh, we will need local regional teams that have the best available data knowledge and experts to help identify meaningful deferrals. They will also consider practical realities. So a provincial prefer deferral process, unfortunately, has is a bit of a blunt instrument. I think we need to get local and, and, and refine that deferral process to, to make sure we buy space while we do create more uh, um, robust, longer term plans. Deferrals are important, but we need to get local to do them. And then we need we can see the provincial experts really updating the biodiversity guidebook or something like that that provides the high level guidance that then regional and local teams can build on to create long-term old growth strategies for their ecosystems or ideally as the Hawaii are doing a fully integrated resource plan for the area not just about old growth but about all the values at play so that we have uh, integration of, of all the values uh, and a strategy that will provide old growth um, and everything else our, our children will need going into the future. So I'll leave it there. Thanks very much, Cam.
that's a, a good overview of a lot of information about uh, BC's forests and and representation, and also some of the uh, the issues that we'll be discussing in detail later. Uh, so now uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Rachel Holt. Uh, Rachel uh, has a PhD from the University of Toronto, um, but she was based at UBC apparently for much of her, her studies. And uh, she's a registered professional biologist in British Columbia and works as an independent ecologist. She's worked on uh, the ecology and management of old growth forests for over 25 years. And uh, she uh, served on the Forest Practices Board of BC, which is a board that uh, oversees um, that forest practices and, and uh, ensuring that uh, goals and, and standards are being met by professionals. And uh, two of the years she was on the Forest Practices Board, she was a vice chair uh, in that role. Um, so she has a lot of experience in forestry in BC. And uh, she was recently a member of the BC Old Growth Technical Advisory Panel and um, produced uh, a report on the uh, extent of remaining old growth. So Rachel, I'm very looking, I'm very much looking forward to your uh, comments today. Who am I? I'm an ecologist, uh, independent consultant. Uh, I'm assuming that you can see this slide, Sally, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, I've worked primarily for the provincial government for the last 25 years uh, on old growth and many other issues in landscape planning, climate, old growth, First Nations issues. Um, I was an, a witness uh, in the successful Blueberry River First Nation Treaty Rights Supreme Court case recently, and uh, I was on the Minister's Technical Advisory Panel on old growth. Um, I note my two colleagues, Dave Dowse and Karen Price, because they have worked on all of this technical work um, along with myself. So I'm going to give us a bit of a whirlwind tour. Um, most people look at the forest at this scale or at this scale. Um, we forget British Columbia is really very, very large. And uh, in the context of North America, it's globally unique. The biodiversity in British Columbia and the forests in British Columbia are um, unique from a global sense. Um, the last grizzly bear was killed in California in 1924. Um, similarly, salmon um, have declined across the entire uh, Pacific coast of North America. And um, although we have salmon in trouble here um, for various reasons, um, we have the best opportunities to maintain this global biodiversity and values um, than as there is anywhere else in the world. So from a historic perspective, um, we started here from a settler um, settler perspective. And we see these pictures a lot, but we often don't think about what they meant from an ecosystem perspective. Um, there were entire ecosystems and valleys of trees that looked like this, and they don't exist anymore. So that is the benchmark from which we're working and which we should, which, which we should think. Um, I, We have, I, I had in here a history of, of policy development, but I took it out because Cam just went through it a little bit. We had this attempt to solve this problem back in 1995. And the bottom line is we did not implement these things. I could go through the, the list of things that we didn't implement back, uh, back then. And so for instance, um, you know, timber supply has been the driving force for the reason why we haven't implemented these things that we intended to implement. We have perverse uh, versions of this. So for instance, in the Kootenays, um, we have old growth management areas, only 20% of which are actually old growth. And so we have, I would disagree really very strongly with the CAMS um, balance um, that he had in, in, his, in his view of where we've been at um, to date. And so here, um, these guys said that. They said, we haven't had balance at all. We have been doing a timber subject to constraints approach, and that has not led to a good outcome, and it hasn't led to a balance. And we need to radically shift how we are managing the forest. And, you know, sorry, Gary, you're coming next, but you're not a tree loving hippie and you said it needs to really change. So are we changing? Well, right as the deferrals came out, um, 
the Kofi report or the Cam Brown report said um, there's way more old growth out there. And we could have an entire workshop, and I actually think we should have an entire workshop on how much old growth there is and why this matters. Um, but the intention of this report and what it actually says when you when you drill it down is the report says there isn't a problem in the forest. There's lots of old forest. It's protected in all these different ways. We're all good. So it wasn't really a buy in to the concept that we needed to change. And since that time in the work that I do, I have watched as industry and industry lobby has put significant effort into undermining the attempt to change out there. And that is a problem. In particular, there's been a really strong emphasis on the, the a denial of the idea that we need to protect some of the last, last remaining large forests out there. So that report was in response to our report, which we published and is available on my website and also as a peer-reviewed paper. The key things that we said in our report, the key messages were this. We have to stop combining very, and I'm supposed to say different types of old growth into one large number. Because forests are really different and they have different ecological functions, structures, carbon storage, they are very different. So when you see a big number, it's meaningless. We said the largest trees in almost every ecosystem across the province have been heavily impacted and the remaining large forests are at very high risk. And so a cost filter analysis, as Cam just showed us on his slides, is totally meaningless to take a biogeochromatic variant and say there's this much old growth remaining, completely swamps out the effects of how we have harvested the land base. And so it, that is the old school and the way of looking at the forest. And we need to shift that and not do that anymore. That's what we said. And there is very little left of the original large st structured forest out there and the vast majority of the remaining old is small structured and at low risk. Um, failure to take these messages into account will result in failure to properly manage the remaining forests of British Columbia. That is basically what we said. And it is very true that the 3% number got way more airtime than we ever imagined and um, it's probably not three, but it may be five and it may be seven, but it's not 30. And that is that was the key point of our analysis. And if if I had an hour or longer here, I would go through the reasons why um, that is true. But you can go on our website and download um, a summary of that of this critique. But the, so but I will touch on the key failings of the industry analysis. They use us what's called the PSPL site index, the site productivity layer. And it measures the, the productivity of the stand irrespective of what is on the site today. And it does measure future productivity better than VRI site index. But that is not the question that was asked. The question asked is how do, well, so using PSPL site index, doesn't correlate with height or diameter or volume of stands on the ground today. So if we want to look at and reflect the status of current forest stands, using the PSPL site index as was done in that report is completely meaningless. You can go back and download our paper. And I will say this, I will say that I'm surprised at the list of advisors on the most recent report that I read this morning that really don't appear to know this and um, didn't seem to really grasp the question that was being asked. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised by that. So I will just show this, this little summary of, of how we think this works. And we're not standing by the notion of site index being an answer, but it, this is reflective of what we think the forest looks like. So if you take TFL 44 and you break it down into the age class of the forest, this is the kind of meaningless number in my view that doesn't help us. So around 26% of the forest is old. Historically, around 82% of that forest would have been old. 
the CWHBM1 is the most is the largest um, unit in that. So I'm just going to focus in there. And if we look at the breakdown of cell stage by site index groups of VRI site index from the smallest, the least productive, but these are the smallest trees on this land base and the largest trees are over here. If we break it down and look at how much old remains in each of those buckets, in the small end, we have around 30% old. We have large numbers in the low productivity sites. These, this is the non-timber harvesting land base, the stuff that you didn't harvest already. That's why there's lots of old, somewhat approximating how much will be there naturally. But as you move into the more productive sites, you get less and less old forest remaining. And it's this that gets missed when we combine information and lump it together and say there's lots of old growth remaining. If you repeat that analysis with tree size, you get very much the same pattern. We have a high percent remaining of old forest in places with small trees, and we have a low or very low percent of, of old forest remaining in places with large trees. And of course, to do this analysis right, you actually have to consider that you've already lost a significant proportion of the biggest trees. The reason why you site index in the first case was because you can't do this analysis based on um, tree size because you are missing information like this. If you look at the trees that are there today, we have to remember that there were a whole bunch of other trees that have disappeared from the pool of trees that we can analyze. And so you can't do a risk analysis based on tree size. Those are those ghost trees. This is all a bit of a red herring. Um, And what worries me is that it's really about denial. It's denial about the fact that we have a problem on the land base. We've seen this before in industry. And frankly, I honestly think that we're seeing it again. And I think there's an awful lot of well-meaning folks who are trying to shed light on this issue. But in the big picture, I'm seeing a large amount of lobbying that actually is just trying to make this issue go away. So what are the barriers to move forward? Um, I was going to title this slide, the lack of effective policy, but I will retitle it and say we have a lack of intention to do it right. That's what we've seen. That's what I've seen in terms of implementation over the last 25 years of my career. And we could do resilience planning. It's what the OGSR tells us to do. They have told us how to do this right. But instead, what we're seeing in response is a lot of denial about the fact that there's actually a problem. We've seen very little movement on the recommendations in the OGSR. We've seen an awful lot of fighting about the thing that was supposed to just create space and allow us to move forward. And in fact, we need to do a whole bunch of work and that hasn't happened yet. I believe that almost any tool could work going forward if we decide to implement it correctly. But so far, we haven't seen that. Um, some of you may know I've been heavily involved working for the nation directly and as a witness in the Supreme Court case for, for the Blueberry River First Nation. Um, if you want a good read on how we fail to manage the land well in BC, it goes through a large number of these issues, failure to assess and manage for cumulative effects, failure to consider treaty rights and maintain a healthy, stable environment and ecosystem to maintain those rights. And I see a great deal of the similar rhetoric happening um, this is just one of the findings from the court case, the stubbornly staying the course approach that we have tended to go with in the province. Uh, in the court's view, prudence would require a pause in development. Ordinary prudence would require um, long term planning, looking ahead, uh, as opposed to simply stubbornly staying the course. It's interesting in my life right now that these two things are kind of going side by side. So what are the key fallacies? Well, Combining, combining different types of old growth into large numbers and conflating the THLB, the timber harvesting land base, with the non-THLB. When you see statements like this, they are combining forests that look like forests on the left with forests on the right. And this is meaningless. This is what we were trying to bring attention to in our report. 
any study that suggests that the non-timber harvesting land base is ecologically equivalent to the timber harvesting land base is highly misleading. Um, we have to move away from this. The reason, there is a reason why areas haven't been harvested and it's because they have different forests in them. And not to say that one is better or worse than the other, but one is at high risk and the other is at much lower risk. The next fallacy and the thing that's got us there is that is we've had policies that drive our protection into areas um, that are not at risk, i.e. saving the part of the forest that you weren't going to log. The timber supply caps got us to this state and the, without unduly um, reducing the timber supply of the province, that, that legal direction got us here. We have an unrepresentative protected area system in BC. Um, there's 15% protected overall, 45% of the alpine, however, and most lower elevation ecosystems have less than 5%. And in fact, most of them have less than 1% actually protected. So we are extremely unbalanced in our basic status in the province. And we've seen this also with implementation of the deferrals in some places. Um, you can sign on to a large proportion of the deferrals without setting aside the places that were about to be logged. And um, I certainly am aware of some examples of that happening. Um, by the way, the reason we identified deferrals across all ecosystems is because it's really important to be representative of all ecosystems. And we looked at the amount of risk associated with each one in order to get there. The, the third fallacy that I talk about is simply talking about how many big trees remain without considering how many big trees have been logged. Uh, this is that sliding baseline or ghost tree issue, and it's a real fundamental problem. So the old growth of technical advisory panel mapped the tree size from very small to very large within every biogeochromatic variant in the province, using the data for each individual biogeochromatic variant. So it's all relative to each other. Um, I'm going to show you what that looks like for Southern Vancouver Island. If we, this is all old growth and uh, Stuart Muir would tell you that that's a lot of forest. If you break it down by the size of the trees, you get a different picture. The darkest uh, green is the are the large trees and the lightest colors are the small trees. And so if I call it in blue, just the very small and the small, this is how much of that old growth turns into those categories. And remember, this is by biogeochromatic variant. So it doesn't mix and match between mountain hemlock and uh, CWH, for example, and it's by variant. So, the darkest green on here likely looks like this. And I don't ever like the pulling out of individual trees in a stand because we're, we're thinking about stand attributes. And um, the blue on here are the high elevation mountain tops. You can see it if you're, if you're aware of the geography of the place, of course. Um, on this slide, I've colored the medium small and the very small blue. So the amount of dark green, the large and the very large, this is actual tree size, remember, measured from VRI, um, is now we have much less large and very large trees remaining. And if I look at the rest of the land base, this is the forest that is um, 80 to 140 years old, so logged way back. This is the forest that was that is 40 to 80 years old, so it was logged 40 to 80 years ago. This is the forest that is zero to 40 years old, so has been logged in the last 40 years. And now we can see the remaining old growth in its context. And if I turn on the medium, small and very small old growth as blue, then you can see, or you can't see, um, the remaining larger old forest on this map. And if you take your time to study it, you can see various places of political interest um, that show up on the map. So this guy, um, he's called, he was called Hobson. And Hobson's choice is a free choice in which only one thing is offered. And I work for an array of First Nations around the province and across the board, they want change. We just heard it from Chief Dennis and I'm, very much heard that. Um, 
but in the forest management context, they are generally not being offered change. They're being offered the, in, the existing industrial forest model that has got us here, and that is a problem. Um, I appreciate that this is a complex problem, and if I had more time, I would talk more about it, but this is, this is the key issue that we're in here. Um, there are real opportunities for change, and carbon is one of those. And not only is it an opportunity, but it's actually a necessity. Um, I have a whole other talk on looking at the state of carbon and how much carbon is in these forests and how much gets released. But again, we don't have time for that. So as we saw, and as the chief mentioned, um, people are starting to take advantage of this. I don't know about the substance of what was in that announcement uh, with Mosaic's recent recent announcement, but there are alternative options out there. And in terms of jobs, we have to remember that here in British Columbia, we get some of the lowest jobs per cubic meter in Canada and in the Western world, less than two jobs per cubic meter. My local mill in the West Coonies gets around nine jobs per meter, but in Europe, they're at 30 plus jobs per cubic meter. And what are we doing here? Well, this is a raw log ship sending sending wood away, but um, Western Forest Products, for instance, sends a huge amount of rough cut cedar to New Zealand in order to be finished, and then it gets shipped back to Eastern uh, North America to be sold at a high premium. We need to be doing this here in British Columbia, and we haven't. We haven't made this transition. So yes, old growth deferrals may be making it hard for value-added manufacturers to get their wood supply today, but it's not the actual deferrals that, it, that is getting us there. It's the fact that the tenure system has most of the volume with the five major companies, and they can make their own decisions in terms of where that wood goes. And right now, it apparently pays to send rough cut cedar from Vancouver Island to New Zealand and ship it back to, to North America. That is problematic from every element and we have to stop doing it. So where's the opportunity? Uh, industry transition is inevitable. It's never been sustainable to log a thousand year old or 200 year old trees. Um, from a carbon perspective, the carbon associated with forest management in British Columbia exceeds pretty much every other um, GHG emissions, and we do not currently adequately deal with that at all. We need leadership on carbon tourism on the alternative economies, and managing for ecosystem health does take care of most of these values. And the thing that worries me most is if we are in denial modes, then no rules will ever solve these, these problems. So, what are, the, what are my calls to action? Well, first of all, within the government, I would make sure those who are in charge of the paradigm shift actually believe in the paradigm shift. That should be step one. We actually have to implement the OGSR recommendations. We need to guarantee a significant proportion of the province's volume to the value added community so that we can actually move the transition that we talked about in the 80s through to reality today so that um, the chief and other communities around the province actually get their jobs for the trees that are harvested. We have to make sure that it doesn't pay to ship raw or rough sawn logs out of the province. We have to stop playing games with numbers. It's endless and we won't get anywhere if we do that. We've heard it a lot around the amount of old growth and we've heard it hugely around the economics of what's happening in the province right now. And we have to ensure that the forest policy of BC actually reflects their apparent strong commitment to climate needs. This is, so, this is relevant to the pellets, it's re relevant to old growth, and it's relevant to counting carbon on a relevant time frame. So which way are we going? Well, I, I read something this morning where Chief Dennis said this, it is time to move past a battle of numbers. We have to move forward um, absolutely, and I think we're on page with that. But what concerns me is if we still have signs on the side of the road that say this, then we are missing the point on the values of these forests and how variable and different they are and how to manage them properly. We will not get to a positive place if we cannot get on the same page about the risks and the values associated with British Columbia's old growth forests. Thank you.
Thanks very much for that, Rachel. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of information, and also uh, a very strong call for the need for a big paradigm shift that people making that call believe in. I think that's a, a really important point. So uh, with that, that brings us to our final speaker. And uh, so our last speaker is Dr. Gary Merkel. I can call Gary that because he has an honorary PhD from UBC that I believe he received about a year ago. And uh, he received that uh, for his many contributions uh, to uh, forestry uh, in BC. So he's a registered professional forester with uh, over 45 years of experience. Uh, he is also a member of the two-person independent panel that produced the old growth strategy um, report and has been very central to old growth issues and our way through uh, these issues. Uh, Gary is a member of the Taltan Nation in Northwest British Columbia. And thank you so much for joining us today, Gary. The screen is yours. Thank you, Sally. Uh, I'm just waiting for the share menu to come up. There we go. Okay. Uh, okay. Can you? Uh, we see can this? see your. We can see your slides, but they're not in slideshow. There we go. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Well, thanks, Sally. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, it was. Uh, if we learn nothing else from this conversation so far. We've learned that uh, there's a lot of different thoughts and opinions. And uh, one of the things that we, Al and I knew right away when we did the old growth review was we were gonna hear a lot of different views on this subject, and we certainly did. But one common thing that we heard that I was really quite surprised about was from every sector that we needed to change. And so I'll speak a bit about the old growth review, but not a whole bunch and really more about the path forward in terms of implementation. Uh, this Nadid Deniza Uche or Huhaklika Kiakunik, this this just means my Teltan name is Nadid Deniza and my Tenaka name is Kiakhunik. Uh, Nadi Deniza means strong man, and uh, Kiakhunik means fish person. So, uh, so just a couple opening thoughts. Uh, it should be obvious, but the first rule of intelligent tinkering is to keep all the parts. Um, and that should be obvious, but for some reason, not as obvious when it comes to this conversation. And then second is smooth sailing does not make a skillful sailor. In other words, working through the bumps, working through the gales, working through the storms, working through the doldrums, and working through all the different pieces is what makes you skillful because you have to work hard to get what you want so why 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 are we even concerned about this uh this conversation and our observation was that the general public has already made a shift and and want to see things done differently and when i say general i mean every sector wants to see something uh general public local governments, First Nations, industry, uh, government itself, uh, the provincial government, uh, every every sector that we spoke to universally, except for I think one person that I can think of uh, said that everything's fine. We also, as you saw with Chief Robert, we're, we're seeing the indigenous community is really pushing the envelope here now and really forcing us to start thinking of land as a whole and to adopt much different ways of viewing and stewarding lands. Um, 
and I that's going to that transition is going to take a little bit of time, but nonetheless is really pushing us to a whole new standard of land care. The costs to other sectors of our current forest management system um, have really become unacceptable, and uh, tourism is by far the largest uh, industry in British Columbia, and uh, the negative impacts to our image and our tourism sector is huge from the kinds of practices that we're doing in the forest sector right now. We've seen the numbers. We're also seeing a lot of major species being lost from the kinds of management that we're doing. Caribou, uh, moose, uh, and you know, getting into species that people actually care about and are akin to and use in their lives. We, um, we have a lot of frustration. Rachel expressed this uh, earlier. We did have an old growth strategy in British Columbia uh, about 30 years ago. Uh, we just didn't implement it. Um, we, we implemented parts of it, but the intent, I think that's a good observation. The, the, in our observation and everybody we talked to is involved in developing that. It was just like 200 people involved from all sectors. It was just a failure uh, of uh, uh, intent. And this notion now we manage for timber subject to constraints is a management model that simply does not work. The list of constraints just is endless. Um, and constraints are really our perception of what we think is important at any given time. It has nothing really to do, frankly, with what the land needs and what the land, uh, uh, the pieces that the net land needs to stay healthy. It may have something to do with that, but it may not. It may have something to do with something completely different. It may be just our sensibilities that we're trying to put constraints on. And there's so many of them that are conflicting and hard to manage for, and so many interest groups. And that, that whole way of thinking is a human-centric view, not a land-centric. And we also found that uh, it's surprising how few managers, um, uh, land managers, and all the ologists, I'll call them, it's surprising how many of them don't understand how ecosystems work and how to manage to maintain ecosystem health. When we manage, when we, when we live with land, we have a range of approaches one that just says, let nature be and just try to live with it. Try to live in your place, very much a lot like the indigenous communities, the earth-based cultures uh, would have done in the past. Try to live in your place and be respectful in that place. And at the far end, uh, it doesn't matter what we do to nature. We're not part of it, we're above it, we can do what we like. There really isn't any consequences. The path that we chose was somewhere in the middle. We have made a choice to, man to manage nature by stopping fire and other natural processes in the ecosystem. Um, and the stopping of those processes ha has extremely negative consequences over time in a way similar to overusing the land has very negative consequences over time. So if we choose to stop nature's processes, then we need some way of compensating and trying to maintain the patterns that would normally exist on the land so that the land can stay healthy, so that the ecosystems can stay healthy, so that they don't become overgrown and foster large scale uh, infestations and bugs and fire and all the rest of that type of thing. And so the old growth report was really not about old growth. Uh, it, it, it was true we were asked to look at old growth, but we came to the conclusion that old growth, just focusing on old growth only is frankly a bit of a, it's too much, too narrow, too, too introverted is the way we care issue here to start managing to keep us and really reaching healthy ecosystems. Um, and so we had a set of recommendations to do that. Um, any one of you 
um, can look at this uh, can look at the that they're not so much about old growth as they are changing the way we manage and the way we look at forests. To do this under an indigenous government to government partnership, to ground our management in regional um, management boards, uh, to take an ecosystem approach, et cetera. But first, we do need some kind of a shift and Rachel put this up already, so I won't go into it. We need to shift the way we actually look at forests and stop thinking about them as sources of timber that we can just manage subject to constraints and that we really need to think about not just our forests, but our land as a whole. How do we manage it and look after the health of it? If we take the assumption being here is that if you look after the health of the land, it will take care of everything else, including you. If you don't, then it will hurt you, is the corollary or the opposite to that. And we think we know these things, um, but we really don't understand them at all. And we try to reduce them. I think there was some good conversations earlier. We try to reduce these systems to something really simple that we think we can understand and make simple rules, but there is no simple rules. Try to keep the pieces, try to keep them connected. The, the model that many countries have gone to now is thinking about ecosystem integrity. And what that means is keep all the pieces and keep all the processes. So if you keep all those and you keep those working, then overall your landscapes and your ecosystems will remain healthy and they will take care of other things. That's the management assumption. And uh, this is important um, if, as we move to managing for ecosystems, we actually have to start learning to think like them a lot more than we are now. We think well on timber, but we don't, and trees, but we don't think well on ecosystems. Trees are the products of ecosystems. Rachel went through a lot of these challenges and Cam went through a lot of these challenges already and Robert alluded to them, but <clears throat> Right now, we're facing a real social light in the forest sector. But BC was built on the timber industry in it for a couple hundred years now, and uh, and it's deeply rooted in everything we do. Um, it, it's one of those things. It's a lot like Alberta with oil and gas. Is we assume that it's always going to be there and it's going to do what it wants, and we can just like it's just so core to us we just accept it as something that's always there and we just have to work around it and so overcoming that and uh, starting to think about how do we maintain um, healthy ecosystems and healthy forests and not just be about timber is is a difficult transition uh, it, it is quite deeply ingrained in british columbia society we also have a pattern in this for in British Columbia that's going to be difficult is that this sector has been rife with conflict for a very long time now and there is a lot of scared people out there. Everybody's afraid for different reasons uh, and we see each other as enemies and it causes deeply rooted divisive behaviors that stop us from coming together and working together properly. We have a lot of systems We've actually, in the old growth implementation, have had to deal with COVID, which has been incredibly difficult to adjust to. Um, we've had to deal with a number of, uh, of uh, climate-related uh, um, dis disasters, I'll call them the floods, the fires, et cetera. All of those are done, a large part of them are done out of the same parts of government that are responsible for implementing this. We have a number of other initiatives that are quite parallel and saying the same thing, modernized land use planning, um, the Together for Wildlife, the changes in the Forest and Range Practices Act, and, and a couple of others that all point towards um, increased Indigenous involvement, uh, DRIPA, uh, moving towards managing for ecosystem health, and greater public involvement um, and in managing forests, changing our rudder from the political bodies to the public uh, management 
expert management bodies. Um, we also are down into the bottom wedge, whoops, of, of oil growth. We, we manage uh, timber in British Columbia on the notion of uh, maximizing volume. And, uh, and, but we have been steadily liquidating the old growth in the timber harvesting land base uh, over the years, which has allowed us to keep our harvest levels higher than what they would be if the whole sec timber harvesting land base was converted to second growth managed forest. We've managed, we've been liquidating that. We're down into the bottom wedge of that now because we've been a few decades into the strategy. The problem is, is when you get down to that place, you're now getting to places that people care about a lot. When there's, when there's a lot out there, you know, people can find another place to go. But as that, that area becomes smaller and smaller and as those iconic areas that you grew up with and that you've seen start to disappear more and more and they just get harder and harder to get to it, it creates huge conflict and fairy creek is one of many similar things that are in this province because people are concerned locally and we've um, we've been struggling uh, in our implementation of this strategy and a lot of it um, I'm not sure if I if it's an intent problem or it's just it's so big that we're frankly a little bit lost right now and a little bit confused I I, I don't I see it translating myself as confusion um, and I I think that's fixable um, if it starts to show to me that it is truly an intent thing and we start to play games like we did with the last one, then you can be sure that I'll be saying that very loudly and trying to fix that. Um, a lot of the how we do this is written in the old growth and I won't go through them. I've talked about them a bit, but we don't have at this point a clear vision of where we really want to end up. The old growth report does provide us that but we need it and we need to communicate it very clearly with very strong outcomes and so far we we have not been strong on this this area and it's really created a lot of confusion and uncertainty for all involved uh, and and uh, I think maybe it's just a I think it's a bit of an overwhelming thing and we just haven't been able to pull it all together. How does DRIPA fit together with this? The Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, how does the watershed security strategy, the Together for Wildlife, FERPA to uh, the old growth strategy, all of these things are all in the same direction, but how do they all fit together and what's that look like when we get to the other side? And, and how do we work through this transition? We're, we're still not entirely clear on that as a public or in the industry sectors. And for industry, this is a real struggle. They, the certainty is required to support industry. Even if it's not, even if it's not your preferred, you need to know what the rules are. You can't have things be cloudy all the time and not be able to work with it. And we are dealing with cloudy in this transition period. We will also have to uh, rationalize our indigenous lands governance framework in this province. The current situation that we're modeling or that we're building is the province maintains probably in the range of somewhere between 150 to 180 separate relationships with indigenous groups and the province is put in the position of being the facilitator, dispute resolver, broker between those. That's a model that frankly is unsustainable. And so we do have to figure out how to rationalize that governance model in a way that lets us put land at the center, but also respects the autonomy of the individual First Nations. And I believe we can do that. We have done this as First Nations in this province in health already. We've done a version of it in, in education and in child and family. And I believe we can do it, um, but it is a major project and necessary in my opinion, to be able to tackle some of these big problems. However, as a lot of the speakers spoke to, 
the we can come up with provincial guidelines and standards, but this is largely a local. In other words, every area of the province is so different. The ecology is different. The economics are different. The social situation, the uh, the First Nations relationships, all of those things are different and need to be tackled differently. We can set broad parameters at a provincial scale, but we really need to empower local people to plan their own futures and move through this. And because we are learning so fast, we have a lot of approach to manage for ecosystem health. And I, I'm going to guess that many of them are valid and will achieve the outcomes that we're looking for. But we don't have a what we don't have is a system to share our experience with each other and learn from each other and in an accelerated way to know what's working and what's not working. And we are going to need that to be able to grow in this path as quickly as possible. And Rachel alluded to this a lot. We really got to move past playing the game and trying to buy more time or the political swings that we see back and forth. And frankly, I see this from all sectors. Everybody's doing it. And I believe myself personally that it's to all of our detriment that that is happening. Um, finally, the longest distance in this, it's not, it's not about land. Land is kind of a suffering third party in this, I'll call it. It's us that's the problem here. And the biggest journey we're going to make is that short distance between our ears and change our way. And this really does require collective wisdom and collective owner make these shifts. We really do need to systematically foster a paradigm shift, a shift in the way that we collectively think about lands. The indigenous lands can be a huge help in this because in, inherent in many indigenous land-based cultures is this notion of the land being a whole and you being belonging to a thing that we really need to build stewardship systems that actually make sense and put us in our proper place. We're going to have a lot of unknowns. We're going to run into a lot of obstacles and unexpected things. Working together lets us work through those. Because solutions, often in almost every case that I work in when I'm working in societal change, require everybody to add something to the solution so that the solution comes out in a holistic way and is supported and owned by people and that they can fix it as they realize that that part didn't work quite as good. Having that done by any one or two or three parties just doesn't work. It doesn't create the kind of change that you need. This is going to take a bit of time. We, we as a society are completely immersed in our culture are, uh, and we're frankly hypocrites. I, I was thinking today of how many elephants we actually killed to do this webinar and all the precious metals that are involved in every single screen and, and all the rest of that stuff. And, uh, and somehow that's got to change that thinking. And this is the tip of the iceberg. This old growth thing is the tip of an iceberg. And so it is an intergenerational change. For all of you young people on the call, I'm really thrilled with your generation and how you're starting to really positive ways to get us out of here. For my generation, we did what we could. Uh, and uh, you're going to do what you could. And hopefully you're going to teach your kids to do even more and maybe in a generation or two we're actually going to get to some place that is somewhat more sustainable as as we keep pushing for making this clear understanding it and bringing people together in it finally i think this is appropriate as humans for some reason we feel like we're above nature and that we're somehow not subject to consequences but that's just totally not true I was reading a quote the other day from a a book. I don't I don't have it here handy with me, but the fellow says we're all concerned about all these highly sophisticated civilizations out there in the universe and if they show up here they're going to think we're all stupid and dumb and backwards and he says but so far we haven't seen any yet. 
And maybe it's because these advanced civilizations don't leave of an, enough of a cosmic trace to even be noticed because they're unsustainable. That's an unsettling thought. It's not the strongest of the species that survive. It's not all of the brainiest or anything like that. It's the ones who are most responsive to change. And the change we need right now is a change in the way we look at land and live with land. That's what our report tried to speak about. And I hope we can do it. Thank you. May do. Thank you so much, Gary, um, for all the work you put in in this area and for that and for that thoughtful overview. And uh, I've heard you say before, uh, we've been managing timber and we need to be thinking about and managing forests. And I think that that wraps that addresses a lot of this. Uh, now we've heard from um, we heard from Chief Dennis how. The Huayat Nation is approaching forest management on their local tenure in keeping with their, their uh, priorities, their objectives, and uh, local biodiversity. We've heard about the challenges of uh, old growth from, uh, from a, a, a data and interpretation standpoint and from different perspectives. We've heard about the overwhelming call from the public that uh, Gary and uh, Al Gorley listened to and others about the need for a big paradigm shift in forestry. And I'm going to wrap this up with one question that I would like a short answer from each panelist on. Uh, and then we are going to uh, hopefully reconvene another time to have a, a more um, thorough discussion on this issue. But the, my first question turned out to also be posed by someone on Slido and be the top question there. And so, first of all, do you think we need a big paradigm shift in forestry in BC? Yes or no? I suspect I know what the answer is. And if so, what is the single most effective first step that the province and the Minister of Forests could take in that direction? I know that Gary's outlined 14 necessary steps, and there are many involved beyond that, but one step. And I will, uh, and do we still have, um, do we still have Robert Dennis on the call? Maybe there, so, um, so Chief Dennis, maybe you could start. Single step that the province could take to, uh, move towards uh, better forestry more broadly. I think your mic is muted. There, how's that? Is that muted Great. now? Yeah, yeah we do need a, a, a big shift here. And uh, that's why Hawaii First Nation began their shift in 1993. I think if people listen to my presentation carefully, that uh, this, this issue just isn't about old growth. Old growth is only one of the issues of forest management. And that's what we're saying. And, and certainly, you know, we're, we're, we're hoping people hear us. Uh, I, I don't have a scholarly message for you today. I have a very simple First Nation perspective of things. We have a small uh, territory on the west coast of Vancouver Island. Uh, we saw the, the government's wreck this and the, the industry wreck this in a short 150 years. Now we're going to fix it. That's the change that we're making. And we want to change it to, to, to what it, you know, something that it looked like, you know, before, before settlers came to our land. And so, you know, the, so there, there is a big shift. And what was the second part? Uh, the, if you could, uh, one change, if you could recommend one change that the Minister of Forests could make that would it, set for us me, on a better path. We, we've been advocating very loudly and clearly. Give us our two years to develop our integrated resource management plan and let that be the plan moving forward. Because our our land isn't isn't connected to I mean isn't the same as other lands in BC. I, I don't know what's happening in other parts of BC, 
but I do know what's happening in Hawaii territory. And this is what I want to happen in Hawaii territory moving forward. But let us develop that plan. Our land, our decision. Thank you. Excellent. And I think your uh, the indigenous knowledge and also that local management is is so critical. Yeah. Uh, now, Cam, would you like to respond to that question? Sure. Absolutely, change is needed. The status quo is not acceptable. Um, and the single best thing that we can do is bring this local, engage First Nations, and we've started to do it in IRMPs as, as Robert Dennis is doing. Uh, there are forest landscape planning processes starting. Unfortunately, they've been very cumbersome and slow to get off the ground, but we, we really need to engage in these local land use processes that have First Nations at the table and set the right parameters for local management at each of those ecosystems. Thank you. And Rachel. Um, I think that we need um, to enshrine the new goal. So Gary has outlined in the paradigm shift that we need to shift our goals and the new goal. And I'm not since I only get one answer, I'm not going to cover the First Nations aspect of this, which is, of course, to implement Dripper um, with actual meaning and full intent, which is not what I've seen necessarily in my other work, but um, would be something like um, a meaningful biodiversity law that puts putting the ecosystem first at the forefront of our management framework for all elements of land management. That, so we think about maintaining, we, we put ecological integrity as the goal and we legalize that, and that needs to encompass the carbon element, uh, the, the long-term carbon element associated with uh, all of our uh, management decisions. And so that we actually put the future of our local ecosystems and our global ecosystems first and foremost in decision-making, which is so far from where we've been and uh, unfortunately, local forest landscape planning run by industry won't answer those questions unless we put that first. We have to be clear about the intent, of what we're trying to do. We have to legalize that. Otherwise, we will not get there in the time that we have. Thank you, Rachel. And Gary, your final thoughts on this. And I think you're muted. Obviously, I agree that the paradigm shift is required. Um, and uh, I just first want to reinforce the second recommendation in the old growth strategy was to declare conservation and management of ecosystem health and biodiversity of British Columbia's forests as an overarching priority and an act legislation that legally establishes this priority for all sectors. This is not purely a logging problem. This is an exploration problem. This is an infrastructure problem. This is an urbanization problem and agriculture, all of those things together. But for me, I I think we obviously need law, but you know, and regulation by itself doesn't solve things. Thinking has to change. And for me, I I think we need to take a very strategic approach to facilitating the paradigm shift. A paradigm shift is only a change in thinking. A paradigm shift is not action. It, it, it is the changing the way you think to a new reference point. It often results in a dramatic restructuring or something, but you can actually facilitate a paradigm shift by coming up with very common language that we all understand, building our understanding as a society of how do ecosystems work? How do forests work? How do lands work? We often underestimate the power of our public to understand how land works, which I really find unsettling sometimes that we dummy this down so much for people when I don't believe that we have to. And we, we do need to educate each other and understand this. 
We need to build new structures that reflect that new paradigm, things that are grounded in managing for ecosystem health using our collective wisdom. Um, and we need to celebrate this whole new way of thinking uh, around ecosystems on a, on a regular basis. And part of celebration is tracking your progress and being proud of that and being happy about that and bringing people along together. That's how you change thinking. And as we change thinking, we will have much more minds looking at this and we'll add to our wisdom of this is the right thing to do next or this is the right thing to do next. Having government just simply try to push it down people's throats doesn't work and it really won't work in this situation. We've tried it enough times, you know, and I, I guess maybe just to be a little fatalistic, if we don't fix it, nature will fix it for us. That's the way this works. Thank you, Gary. And I have to agree with you that the next generation is farther ahead on this thinking than we are. Yes. We see that in our students all the time. And uh, so if we don't fix it, hopefully they will, but, but we had better because we've made the mess and, and it's our job to clean it up. So thank you. I would like to thank the panel members. It's been so interesting today. This, present, this um, discussion will go online at trekmagazines.ca slash webcast in a little while. And we are hoping we can reconvene this group for further discussion since we didn't have much time for questions today. Uh, thanks to all the audience for their questions on Slido and uh, hope that all of you can get out in a forest somewhere close to you today. Take care. <laughs>